the Gibson J200, king of the flat tops, one of the most striking guitars in existence. On today's show, I'm gonna share with you five reasons why the Gibson J200 has changed and continues to change the guitar world. Hey, TAC family, welcome to episode 226 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is designed to inject your guitar journey with a weekly dose of fun, focused progress and inspiration. Have you ever wondered what goes through my mind when I pick out a guitar to use on the show or while I teach a lesson? Well, TAC family member Scott asked that very question, and today I have an answer for you. Plus, you're gonna see what awesome A minor guitar lick the TAC family is working on today and your weekly dose of acoustic news awaits, which includes a safari of wildlife inlay, a priceless resonator guitar, and much, much more. But first, the iconic world-altering Gibson J200. I hope you're comfy because we're about to sink into five reasons why the Gibson J200 continues to be a driving force in the acoustic guitar world. Reason number one, the J200 is awesome is because it's the biggest, baddest box around. Yes, the Gibson J200 is called the king of the flat tops and that is for good reason. It is indeed a jumbo guitar, a super jumbo guitar. Here are some factoids about the Gibson J200. Production of this model started in 1937 as Gibson's top of the line flat top guitar by request of Ray Whitley. More on that in just a short moment. Initially, it was called the Super Jumbo. It became the Super Jumbo 200 in 1939. The SJ200 was named for its super large 16 and 7 8 inch flat top body, originally with a red spruce top and rosewood back and sides. In 1947, it changed to maple back and sides. In 1955, the name was officially changed to the J200. Now check this out. Initially, it was thought that Ray Whitley requested the J200 be made but there are four differing hypotheses as to how the J200 actually came about. In an article in 2004 from Vintage Guitar Magazine, they lined out very quickly each of the theories, and here they are. A credible, popular thesis was put forth by Douglas B. Green, Ranger Doug of the Opry's Riders in the Sky, who in 1975 interviewed Western movie star Ray Whitley. In a well-written article for Pickin' Magazine published a couple of years before Whitley's death, Green concluded that a custom SJ-200 made for the cowboy crooner in December 1937 was the first SJ-200. In 1992, an article in 20th Century Guitar stated that an SJ-200 made for 1930s pop star Joe Wolverton was, in fact, the first, claiming that this guitar may actually have been made in 1934. The third major theory was first discussed publicly in a September 1994 article in Vintage Guitar by SJ-200 expert Fred Schrager. In it, he theorized that the original SJ-200 sprang from within a 1937 prototype batch. This theory, with considerable revision, now must be considered as bordering on fact if not fact itself, in light of new information that has accompanied the surfacing of a wonderful old SJ-200 custom. Finally, a fourth article appeared in Vintage Gallery claiming that an SJ-200 made in 1936 for cowboy stuntman Ray Corrigan was the first. Regardless, the SJ-200 is an incredible instrument, and thank God, in and around 1937, 1934, 1935, 1936, it came to be born from the folks at Gibson. Reason number two that the Gibson J200 is an earth-shattering instrument is that it brought a new level of aesthetics. The J200 is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm talking about a stock J200. Aesthetically, it packs an enormous visual punch. You've got the mustache bridge. You've got the engraved pickguard. You've got the crown inlay. You've got the classic Gibson headstock with tulip tuners. You've got striking flame maple back and sides. You've got a neck with usually a walnut stringer down the center. It is just beautiful, not to mention its big size. Oh yeah, and that mustache bridge has some inlay on it as well bound fingerboard, I could go on and on. But aesthetically, the J200 is striking, and that's just putting it lightly. Which brings me to the next reason the Gibson J200 is incredible, and that is it's a blank canvas. Yes, the Gibson J200 is probably one of the most highly customized instruments that Gibson offers. 
offered and continually offers. Check this out. I mean, the the amount of customization on this guitar is unbelievable. Gibson continually pushes the boundaries with this model. You've got the Gibson J200 Montana Gold. You've got the Gibson uh, Double Vine. You've got the Gibson J200 Vine. You've got the Gibson J200 Bob Dylan. You've got Gibson J200s with double pick guards. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're talking Master Museum models from Ren Ferguson. The, the J200 has taken so many visual, uh, aesthetically awesome forms. It is definitely, I think, and I don't have facts on this, but I would say, I would actually put money on it being the most customized Gibson acoustic guitar in existence, period. And definitely a reason why the J200 is incredible. Reason number four, that the Gibson J200 is a guitar that suits every player is that it's a guitar that suits every player. The Gibson J200 is a multi-tool of sorts, and it has been played by every guitar player known to man. In fact, that's a reason why I think it is a multi-tool. If you look at the folks who have chosen a J200 as an instrument, they range in all sorts of musical genres. Let me just give you a quick list. You've got Reverend Gary Davis. You've got Tom Petty. You've got Elvis. You've got Bob Dylan. You've got Jimmy Page. You've got George Harrison, among many, many, many others. The final reason that the Gibson J200 is something that you should strongly consider. The final reason that the Gibson J200 continues to change the face of the acoustic guitar world is that it's a family affair. The Gibson J200 in and of itself is an awesome instrument. However, the J200 is a part of a family of jumbos that has the same profile. However, they come in differing sizes. Here's just a quick mention of some of the options. You've got the J150. You've got the J165, commonly with a cutaway and electronics. You've got the J180. You've got the J185. You've got the J200 Parlor. You've got the L200 Emmylou Harris. These are all guitars that have the J200 profile, but are offered in various sizes. So you still get that visually striking appearance, but you can actually have some comfort if you're a smaller player. Which brings me to a question I have for you. I just shared with you five reasons as to why the Gibson J200 has changed the acoustic guitar world, as to why the Gibson J200 is an awesome guitar that you should consider. So in the comments below, I wanna know why do you or don't you love the Gibson J200? Go ahead and let me know in the comments below. And I wanna add another question to that. Do you think another manufacturer makes a better jumbo than Gibson? If so, in the comments below, let me know what the manu who the manufacturer is and what model you favor instead of the Gibson J200. Why don't you go ahead and grab your guitar? It might even be a J200. Because it's time for the Tuesday Tack Guitar Lick Challenge. Every day within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, we rotate through the five essential categories of guitar improvement. Mondays is a technique challenge. Tuesdays is a guitar lick challenge. Wednesdays an improvisation challenge. Thursdays a rhythm guitar challenge. And Fridays a chord transition challenge. It just so happens to be Tuesday. It's Acoustic Tuesday. And I wanted to let you in on which guitar lick the Tack fans Family is working on today. Here it is. Your Tuesday Tack Guitar Lick Challenge is entitled Head Over Heels. One, because it uses pull-offs and triplets to create kind of a, a, a tumbling motion. And two, because every challenge this week within Tack gives a nod to Valentine's Day and falling in love. You fall head over heels for somebody. There's even a nod to Cupid. There's some other risque terms as well. Let me go ahead and play this lick so you can hear how it does create that, that tumbling, almost falling down a hill motion. Here's how it sounds. It's a great lick that has two awesome uses for your playing. And if you want to learn this note for note, TAC fam, please log in. This is your daily challenge. Go ahead and click start challenge. That'll take you right to the teaching video. And once you get it under your fingers, you can move to the play along video. Pick a speed that's comfortable for you. And don't forget to open up the tab. Click on that icon in the lower right hand corner. And then you can have the video and the tab right next to each other for full comprehension of this lick. Okay, so how do you exactly use this in your playing? 
And as with most licks that I show you, this is a great fill lick, meaning you can use it in between vocal verses. Let's say you're singing a line, it ends on an A minor, and there's a little bit of space before you start singing again. And instead of just strumming, which is totally okay, you can use this lick to add some dimension to your playing, to the song that you're playing. Instead of just strumming on the chord and keeping things kind of flat, this adds some dynamic, it adds some spice and some mojo to your playing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and strum an A minor chord steadily, move to this lick, and then go back to an A minor chord so you can kind of hear it in context. Here's how that would sound. It's a great way to, again, add some dimension to your playing while you're singing a song. It's also a great way to practice this lick. You can strum that A minor chord, move to that lick, come back to the A minor chord, move to that lick, come back to the A minor chord, so on and so forth. It's a great way to get it under your fingers, and it's a great way to start understanding the musical space that it takes up. Once you understand that musical space, it's far easier to inject a lick like this into your playing. Okay, the second use for this, and I, I find this a, a really fantastic use for this lick, is coming out of a solo in the key of A minor. It's a great way to give a nod to the A minor chord, and it's a great way to get yourself back into that rhythm strumming. Much like you just used it, but instead of strumming prior to using the lick, you'd be playing a steady stream of notes. That would sound like this. so on and so forth. It's just a, just a quick stream of notes so you can kind of hear how it fits as the ending to a solo. And the reason this lick works so well is that it's actually using the notes of an A minor chord. So instead of just picking random notes out of the A minor scale, we're giving a nod to that A minor chord so that it kind of puts a nice cap on a solo and really places it musically. Okay, one more thing before we get back to the show. And that's, that's something that involves you learning something new. I wanna shed some light on how best to do that mentally. Now, I think, I think the common pitfall here is that when we see something we wanna learn as guitar players, and when I say we, I'm lumping myself in there as well, we want to learn something as a whole. We want that end product immediately. And what ends up happening is because our sights are set on that end product, we fall into this, this pitfall of feeling like, oh, we're not getting it right away. It's very frustrating. So what I wanna encourage you to do is when you're learning something new, continue to break it down into its smallest pieces. If it feels like you still can't get it, break it down again. If it still, if it still feels like that tiny piece, you just can't get it under your fingers, break it down again. In a lick like this, you can look at it in a number of ways. If you're feeling comfortable with it right off the bat, you can start incorporating it into your rhythm playing, like I showed you. If you're not quite comfortable with it, you can simply get the notes under your fingers. Ignore the pull-offs, ignore the triplets, just get the lay of the land. What notes will you be using? If you feel like the pull-offs are hanging you up, just focus on the pull-offs. Remove the entire lick from your brain and just focus on the simple technique of using a pull-off. If maybe the triplets are hanging you up, just focus on the triplets, aside from the lick. See, what I'm doing here is continuing to break this down into smaller and smaller pieces so we can identify what might be hanging you up, what might be getting in your way of learning the lick in its entirety, and just focus on that. Once you get those tiny pieces, you can start adding them together. And before you know it, you will have the lick as it sounds. You will have that song you're working on. You'll have whatever you're working on, but it does take time. It takes those tiny steps. It's that old adage, how do, you eat, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's how I want you to approach learning anything new on the guitar. 
Back on episode 223 of the show, in fact, that was the episode where I talked about hybrid picking. I actually did a short workshop on hybrid picking. So if you haven't seen that show, uh, go ahead and check it out. Again, that's episode 223. Back on that episode, Scott Bagley, TAC family member Scott Bagley, asked a question about how I choose the guitars that I choose when I teach or when I present something on the show. Here's exactly what Scott asked. Hey, Tony, I have a question. When you select a guitar to play for a new Acoustic Tuesday show or a tack lesson or recording for any reason really, what do you consider? Do you select a guitar for its tone? Is it a better finger picking guitar, scale length? Perhaps there isn't a reason. You just grab what's available or close by. To which uh, username Angel Puerto Rican Vegan Socialist replied, yeah, every time I think I've seen his nicest guitar, he shows another one. I'm jealous. Martins, Thompsons, Bourgeois, Santa Cruz, etc. He has so many. Uh, first and foremost, yes, I have I have a really awesome guitar collection that I am extremely, extremely grateful for. I've been purchasing and, and collecting guitars for since uh, gosh, uh, I want to say 2008. So I've accumulated quite a few instruments. And when I look for instruments or when I'm considering an instrument, I'm very specifically looking for a tone to add to my arsenal, a guitar that offers something that my current lineup does not. And that same philosophy, that same thought process goes into picking out a guitar for the show or for a lesson or really, as Scott said, for a recording or anything. Oftentimes, I'm looking for what a guitar offers in terms of volume, in terms of tone, in terms of sustain. If I'm doing a, a lesson or a presentation on alternate tunings, I'll, I'll look for a guitar that handles lower tunings well, a guitar that really resonates, physically resonates with lower tunings, and also one that offers clarity. So a lot of times I'll reach for my, my custom Martin OM with bird's eye maple back and sides. A lot of times I'll reach for my custom Bourgeois 12 fret, which has Coca Bolo back and sides. Um, I'll also reach for my other Bourgeois OMC custom with a large sound hole. All those guitars offer clarity with, with lower tunings. If I'm doing something that's straight ahead finger picking like ragtime or blues, I'll, I'll look for something that's a little more punchy, that offers a little bit more of a, a, a sonic laser beam, a focused laser beam of sound, for lack of a better term. So I'll look to my beer decophonic. I'll look to my 1935 Martin Single 015. I'll look to my 1956 Martin Single 018. So that's the thought process that goes into me selecting a guitar for a certain style, a certain lesson, etc. Really, the first priority is tone. There is also another factor, and that is I want to play the guitars that I have. I want to keep them lively. I want to keep them open. I want to keep them quote unquote broken in. So a lot of times I'll look at my guitar lineup and say, gosh, what haven't I played in a while? And what fits the bill in terms of what I'm trying to teach and the tone I want to present. So that's kind of a little bit of the thought process behind uh, my selection of instruments and I just out of curiosity of, of, the, of the folks that watch the Acoustic Tuesday show uh, regularly, of the instruments that I've used on the show, which one's your favorite? I'm just curious as to how they come across from the listener's perspective, because of course I've, I've chosen them for very specific reasons, but I'm curious as to what you like. So if one stands out, uh, let me know in the comments below. Awesome question, Scott. I really appreciate you asking. And as usual, uh, if you're sitting there at home and you're watching the show and you think, gosh, I I have a question I'd love for Tony to answer. Uh, go ahead and pop it in the comments. I really want to keep this as a regular segment on the show because it uh, gives me a chance to, well, of course, answer your questions, but kind of create a, a guitar geek discussion with you. Uh, moving on to a guitar snow. We're gonna we're gonna hop in the Acoustic Tuesday private jet. I will be your captain. We're gonna head to Blackstone, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, I can't even say that state. Blackstone, Massachusetts. We're gonna visit Steve Poyer. And uh, Steve is a TAC family member and he has a guitar signal that he wants to share with us. Here's what he says about his guitar signal. It's a pretty fantastic one. From left to right, my Yamaha AC3R. Thanks to you, it is tuned to open D. A 1955 Taylor 610, wasn't much of a Maple fan, but thanks to you and your episode on Tone Woods, I reconsidered and picked this barely played beauty up for an absolute steal. 
A Martin HD35 that my wife influenced me to buy, well, allowed is more like it. <laughs> a 2001 Taylor 712 CE with the old Fishman Electronics in it, my main gigging guitar. A custom Taylor guitar with a cedar top and Macassar ebony back and sides, which usually sits in my coffee room in the house so I always can get my 10 minutes of practice in. To my immediate right is my bourgeois deep body OM with an enlarged sound hole with a master grade torrified Adirondack top and master grade Madagascar rosewood back and sides. It's also known as Excalibur, which was a wedding gift from my lovely wife. And last but certainly not least, I'm holding the guitar that means the most to me being it was my first real guitar and was a 24th birthday present from my father, who along with Eric Clapton and his Unplugged album, which my dad and I listened to on the way to hockey practice as a kid, is responsible for my love of acoustic guitars and music my Epiphone Masterbuilt AJ500RE. Thanks for all you do, Tony, for the acoustic community. Through being a first-year TAC member, I have found more fulfillment and progress in my first year than in my 12 years of being self-taught. I have also grown an undying love for bourgeois guitars, which I can place the blame on you, which I can place the blame on you for after seeing your demos. A 12 fret is what I'm what I'm eyeing next. Guitar Geeks Unite. Cheers. Steve, thank you so much for submitting your guitar snow and also for the little uh, the little stories behind each guitar. I truly enjoy that. And the story that stuck out the most to me was the fact that you and your dad listened to that Unplugged album on the way to hockey practice. And it immediately, as soon as I started reading this, it made me think of me driving to hockey, hockey practice with my dad. Um, it was so awesome because actually, my let me let me correct that story. I need to amend it. I would drive to my dad's work with my uncle, my uncle Paul, and we'd listen to this this hour long blues radio show on one of the local radio stations. So that was my first kind of uh, dipping of the toe in the water uh, in the blues realm of music. Then once I'd get to my dad's work, my dad would then take me to hockey practice. This was late at night, by the way and we would continue to listen to music, et cetera. And I remember, uh, you actually jogged my, rem my memory because I would listen to a lot of music that I think I otherwise wouldn't have heard. And it was this nice shared moment. This was well before I even played guitar. So it was kind of one of those moments that was very uh, um, uh, shaping for me as, as a young budding music fan later to become a guitar player. Uh, so thanks for sharing that story, Steve. Very, very cool stuff. Awesome guitar signal. And I'm sorry slash not sorry about your love for bourgeois guitars. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, gosh, I have a story to tell. I have a guitar signal I want to share. Please do it. And uh, I'm going to bring on my lovely assistant, my lovely Chicago Blackhawks loving assistant to tell you how. I wanna to propose to you a win, win, win scenario. I wanna feature you on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Yes, I wanna feature you and your guitar snow or you and your Acoustic Tuesday merchandise. Step number one, go to tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. Once you're there, pick out your favorite guitar snow shirt, your favorite Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, get it shipped directly to your door. Step number two, once your merchandise arrives, go ahead and put it on and take a picture of yourself, either just wearing Acoustic Tuesday merchandise, or if you have a guitar signal shirt, take a picture in front of all of your guitars. And then once you're done with that, step number three is to upload your picture at tonypolacastro.com forward slash shop. There's a link right on that page. Click it, you can upload your photo, and boom, you'll be featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number one, you get featured in the Acoustic Tuesday show. Win number two, you get some cool snazzy Guitar Geek merchandise. Win number three, the biggest win of them all, all proceeds from the TonyPolacastro.com forward slash shop are being donated to Guitars for Vets. You get featured in the show, you get cool new shirts, cool new merchandise, and you help out Guitars for Vets. Win, win, win. Okay, back to the show. Time for your weekly dose of acoustic news you can use. We're gonna kick things off with an inlay that caught my eye. It caught my eye for a very specific reason. Number one, it was a magpie. It is a magpie. This comes from Tim Kill Custom. Tim Kill is an awesome luthier in Australia. He makes Wisenborns and all sorts of really cool instruments. And this just so happens to be 
a really cool inlay. I'm unsure of the materials. It looks like a maybe a mixed epoxy of sort, some sort of mixed and dyed uh, epoxy or plastic or resin. I'm not entirely sure, but it's a magpie. And when I first moved to Montana, I kept seeing these birds fly around. And I thought those are gorgeous. They have these nice long tails. They've got blues and blacks and whites, and they kind of have this shimmer. Really pretty birds when you first see them. And then after living here for over 10 years now, I look at these birds and I'm like, wow, you guys are pains. You're pains in the butts. They get in your garbage and the whole deal. They're still beautiful birds, but uh, they are tenacious. They're actually really smart as well. This isn't a wildlife lesson. I'm just giving you some background as to why this inlay caught my eye. And the cool thing is that it's sitting on a Weisenborn. It's sitting on the headstock of a Weisenborn guitar. And the rosette is also striking. Uh, I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was really cool. And well, I wanted to, I guess, teach you about magpies as well. Uh, next, up, next up on the news list is something extremely useful useful for you finger style guitar players. You finger style guitar players who have hard time keeping your nails strong. Have you ever considered reinforcing your fingernails with a ping pong ball? Well, Will McNichol learned this trick from Clive Carroll and he just took the time to record the entire process for his YouTube channel. So you can watch a video on how to reinforce your fingernails with a ping pong ball. It's incredible, it's very cool, and Will does a great job of explaining it. And by the way, if you don't know who Will McNichol is, um, you gotta look up his music. Absolutely incredible. Specifically the song, Paper Cranes. If you have not heard that song, if you've never heard Will McNichol, check out the song Paper Cranes. It is, it's my favorite Will McNichol song, period. And of course, if you're a finger style guitar player, make sure to check out that entire video. It's pretty darn awesome. Next up on my list here is a Nirvana medley done on the acoustic guitar and bass by Alexander Misko and Dmitry Toparov. They just released this video in the last couple of weeks and I thought, not only is it shot really cool, it just shows really interesting connection and dynamic between these two instruments. Uh, Alexander is an acoustic guitar player that I've always admired from his compositional skills to the way that he physically approaches the instrument. It's really, uh, it's, it's, it's unique. There's, there's nobody else like him. Yes, he does the percussive thing, but he has a whole different way of approaching the instrument, in my opinion. Here's a quick clip of them playing this Nirvana mel medley. Medley, I almost, I almost said, <laughs> I almost said melody. Here's a quick clip of them playing this Nirvana medley. You know how you can consider a guitar priceless? Well, Charlie Parr just made a post a couple of weeks ago that reminded me of how special guitars are in our lives, how much meaning they can hold. Here's a picture of a resonator guitar that Charlie owns. Here's what he says in his post. You're actually gonna hear this guitar in just a moment, but here's what he says. This wasn't my first resonator guitar, certainly not my last. I bought this national guitar, Delphi, from Willie's American Guitars in the late 90s, and it's been in 15 countries, nearly all of the lower 48, had its neck broken twice and repaired by the late great Don Young, and helped me record a dozen albums. <laughs> helped me record a dozen albums. It's got photos of my kids glued to it and a giant rooster painted on the back by my son, then three, now 20 and I cherish and adore this instrument. I'm bringing it to Cedar Lounge Beer and Earth Rider Beer on Wednesday this week. Maybe we'll play this weird corruption of Sleepy John Estes, Lawyer Clark Blues. And yes, this guitar looks incredible. Yes, it's it's been ridden hard and put away wet, and it holds clearly a lot of meaning. Let's go ahead and listen to this guitar on the song that Charlie mentioned.
One final thing I wanna bring your guitar geek attention to, and it comes from the Martin Custom Shop. It's an inlay of a large mouth bass on the back of a guitar, and it is purely 100% stunning. I just wanted to show this to you because it kind of bookends our safari of wildlife inlay. We started off with a magpie, we're wrapping things up with a large mouth bass. And then just now, I'm looking at this post and I see, first of all, the caption from Martin. Tell me you like fishing without telling me you like fishing. Clearly, if you purchase this guitar or have this guitar commissioned for you, uh, you, you very much like fishing. And then I was looking at the comments. The first comment comes from Billy Strings. And he says, and he says, yo, are you guys like secretly making this for me? Or, which I thought was awesome and very fitting because if you follow Billy at all, you know that he loves fishing especially for bass, really for anything under the water. Uh, so with that, I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today. But first, let's take a sneak peek into next week. Next week, we're gonna do another Lesson Behind the Lick segment, and I am very, very excited for this. Next week, we'll be looking at the Lick Special Swamp Sauce from Tony's Acoustic Challenge, and the Lesson Behind the Lick will be focused on adding staccato to your guitar playing. Yes, next week, it's all about staccato and how you can use it in your guitar journey. That's happening next week on the Acoustic Tuesday. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today. And one more thing before I let you go. Your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Be nice and play guitar. Guitar Geeks Unite. Cheers.